So, um, basically what, what we're going to do today is a brief recap on what we had learned last time, which is basically the bridging reaction. I'll do a brief recap, just probably even talk a bit about uh, the issue of uh, the regulation, which you had gone to do, and then the next thing is I'll quickly go into the TCSI, right? Alright, so those of you that went to study bridging reaction, what do you remember? Any enzymes there? Yes. Okay, so it has lipoamide or lipoic acid, it has NAD, FAT, coenzyme A, and it has thiamine pyrophosphate. So we made it clear that, again, these are vitamin derivatives, many of them. The, enzyme, the, the coenzyme you see are mainly vitamin derivatives. For instance, if you look at thiamine pyrophosphate, it's a derivative of vitamin B1, right? It's the activated form. But we can always cite the different um, reactions that are actually catalyzed by enzymes which are assisted by these um, coenzymes, which are actually vitamin derivatives. We talked about vitamin B, B2 riboflavine being used as a coenzyme as Flavin adenine the nucleotide and thiamine and niacin being used as nicotinamide adenine the nucleotide. So the bridging reaction, since I already showed this last time, we said that in this reaction we are basically transitioning from glycolysis into the TCA. We said this reaction is not necessarily a reaction belonging to either of the two, but it is the link between the two parts. All right? So, if you see, we showed that thiamine pyrophosphate, when it comes in, reacts with the acetal A, And this being the first reaction of the bridging reaction, what you're going to see, not really, this is the end product. This is reacting with, with pyruvate. The pyruvate came from, from glycolysis, right? Yeah. It came in assisted with the help of a pyruvate transporter and in the mitochondria, this is where we're seeing this reaction, right? So we're able to show that with the help of thiamine pyrophosphate, this carbon dioxide is going to come out, and then you're going to have a hydroxyl field <coughs> thiamine pyrophosphate. Then the next reaction is going to be assisted with an oxidized form of lipoic acid, right? So the oxidized form of lipoic acid is going to abstract uh, this acetal group, right? And then, I think I showed this reaction, anyway. So, quickly, it's going to form And then the thiamine pyrophosphate can go back and be used in the next reaction. The next thing is that this is where you're going to see the coenzyme A coming in, which basically is going to abstract this acetal group here, and it will release a reduced form of lipoid, like that. 
and ultimately this is actually going to come out as a double A. Then finally, you are going to see that this reduced uh, depoic acid, dipoamide, is actually going to be oxidized with the help of FAD, which comes in oxidized form. Ultimately, it becomes reduced. And finally, the oxidized form of FAD will be reproduced with the help of NAD. This NAD will come oxidized and ultimately it's actually going to be reduced like that. This is basically the, what the reaction will look like. However, I made it clear that there are three enzymes that will play this role. We refer to them as E1, E2, and E3. E1 this is called pyruvate dehydrogenase. This is catalyzed by three enzymes which we refer to as the pyruvate dehydrogenase complex. Complex for a good reason because there are three enzymes attached to it. So E1 is called pyruvate dehydrogenase or pyruvate decarboxylase for a good reason that it's decarboxylating pyruvate. So this is pyruvate decarboxylase. E2, on the other hand, because it uses the poamide, is actually called dihydro dipoic transacetylase. Yes, transacetylase because ultimately there is an acetyl group being transferred there and there. The acetyl group is being transferred. The E3 is actually called dihydro dipoil dehydrogenase. That's E3. It's basically the same enzyme that is going to actually uh, oxidize the lipoic acid to the oxidized form and then form the reduced form of FAD and then it's going to be the same enzyme that will actually produce the oxidized FAD from oxidized NAD. Now, from this reaction, we will have been able to see the five enzymes themselves. Thermine pyrophosphate there, we will have seen the poic acid, and we will have seen the coenzyme A, FAD, and NAD. This reaction, if you look at it from most books, is actually written in a very simple form, but they will still tell you that it has five coenzymes. So what is written is that there is pyruvate, pyruvate being converted into acetal A, and then this reaction, carbon dioxide is coming, CoA is coming in, carbon dioxide is coming out, NAD is coming in, and NADH plus H plus going out. And at this point, really, it doesn't seem to make so much sense as to why we mentioned that it has five coenzymes. Right? But we will have, from this point, explained and made it clear why we talk about the five coenzymes. Now, I went on to tell you that this bridging reaction does not only have uh, three enzymes. Basically, there are two other enzymes whose role is regulatory. There is what we call the pyruvate dehydrogenase kinase and the pyruvate dehydrogenase 
phosphatase. These two reactions, they are not necessarily involved in the conversion of pyruvate in acetyl coca However, their primary role is to regulate the bridging reaction. So, from what we have learned, the kinase is actually going to be adding phosphates and the phosphatase is going to be removing phosphates. What primarily happens here is that when the kinase is activated, what it will do is that it is going to phosphorylate this entire uh, complex. Particularly the phosphorylation will occur around the carboxylase. When the carboxylase has been phosphorylated, it is actually going to have conformational change which will actually render it inactive. So basically, as I've always told you, the easiest way of understanding what is going to happen is think about the circumstance in which this is happening. This kind of a reaction would mainly happen in a circumstance where somebody has eaten some carbohydrates. Is that clear? Think about it from that perspective. Rather than you mastering too many things, think about what is going to happen when somebody has eaten or when somebody is in starvation. When somebody has eaten, what is going to happen is that Due to the high amounts of glucose, there will be high amounts of insulin and we made it clear from the last time that insulin, the role of insulin is basically to lead to phosphorylation of enzymes, right? So what will happen is that if somebody has eaten carbohydrates, they will actually be able to produce enough insulin which will actually lead to uh, dephosphorylation rather. Let's say phosphorylation. Dephosphorylation of enzymes. So it will actually bring out the insulin from the beta cells, which is actually going to allow uh, phosphorylation activation of an enzyme called protein phosphatase. One. This enzyme will have many roles. One of the roles of this enzyme is probably going to be to dephosphorylate enzymes that are involved in glycolysis. But you shouldn't. This is not limited to glycolysis. It is going to dephosphorylate enzymes that are involved in metabolism of lipids, metabolism of, for example, um, proteins as well. So, in this case, our focus is going to be what would be its role when it comes to metabolism of carbohydrates. It will dephosphorylate the bifunctional enzyme, the one that we were talking about last week, which is phosphofructokinase 2, which also has the fructose 2, 6, this phosphatase activity, right? This is one thing it's going to do. It will also dephosphorylate pyruvate kinase, the enzyme that converts phosphoenyl pyruvate into pyruvate. At the same time, it will dephosphorylate these two enzymes. Alright? So when these two enzymes have been dephosphorylated, the result is that the kinase becomes inactive while the phosphatase becomes active. The kinase becomes inactive, the phosphatase becomes active. When the phosphatase is activated, its role is going to be to dephosphorylate parametric carboxylate. And when parametric carboxylase is, is dephosphorylated, it will ultimately play its role and parametric will be converted into acetyl coal. This makes so much sense because the conversion of pyruvate into acetyl coal should mainly happen in a circumstance where you have enough carbohydrates. Make sense? On the other hand, however, if somebody is in starvation, the hormone that is going to be predominant is glucagon, right? We explained this part. So, glucagon is going to be produced from the beta cells due to the reduction in, in, in glucose in the blood. When glucagon has been produced, it's going to move through the blood, going to bind to its receptor, which I've been mentioning as a, a G protein, which is ultimately going to lead to activation of an enzyme called adenylocyclase, 
When an anaerobic cyclase has been activated, if you convert ATP into cyclic AMP, see something that will still come and build up and come to this on glycolysis in on um, glucagon uh, uh, glycogen metabolism, right? So I want to build on this slowly. So glucagon binds to its receptor, it binds to its receptor to actually lead to activation of adenylocyclase. Adenylocyclase, as the name suggests, is an enzyme which is actually going to convert ATP into cyclic AMP, cyclides ATP. Then cyclic AMP will activate an enzyme called a cyclic AMP dependent protein kinase. This cyclic AMP dependent protein kinase is also called PKA1, protein kinase A, A, right? Protein kinase A. This enzyme, like the role of protein phosphatase 1, its enzyme is made, this enzyme, the activity is antagonistic to what this one does. So, what this enzyme is going to do is to phosphorylate the many enzymes. That phosphorylation, I think we could have mentioned this at some point, phosphorylation is actually going to occur on different parts of an enzyme and mainly on those parts of an enzyme what you find is that there will be amino acids such as serine, threonine and tyrosine. So phosphates are going to attach to these amino acids because they have a hydroxyl group on them. Once these phosphates have been attached, it will actually lead to conformation change, which would mean that those enzymes will either be activated or deactivated. For instance, it will actually phosphorylate this bifunctional enzyme, uh, phosphofructokinase 2 and fructose 2,6 with phosphatase. The effect of phosphorylating this enzyme is that you see that the kinase part will be inactive while the phosphatase part becomes activated. The result is that this enzyme will break down fructose 2,6 this phosphate, produce fructose 6 phosphate, and it will reduce its inhibitory effect on phosphatokinase 1, and uh, it will reduce its, act, uh, its act stimulatory effect on phosphatokinase 1, and its inhibitory effect on fructose 1,6 phosphatase. Then, the result is that gluconeogenesis will be more predominant. In the same way, when this enzyme has been phosphorylated, it will be rendered inactive, so there will be a reduction in the production of pyruvate from in our pyruvate. At the same time, this enzyme will also phosphorylate this, these two enzymes. It will phosphorylate the kinase and phosphorylate the phosphatase. The result of phosphorylating the kinase 